Chapter 3. William lay in bed for a long time without sleeping. He heard the front door close gently. That's Mom. One more to go, he whispered to Bear, who lay beside him, dressed in William's old sweatshirt. William's mother was a pediatrician. She had evening office hours so that working parents could bring their children in for checkups. So who takes me to checkups? William once asked. Mrs. Phillips, his mother replied. That's why I'm able to work. I know you're in good hands. William didn't answer because he knew that was true, but something about it gnawed at him. Last year, his mother had run for the school board, so now she had meetings after office hours twice a month. But that was all right, too, because Mrs. Phillips was always there on weeknights. William listened to the sounds his mother made as she moved through the house. Let's pretend we're asleep, he whispered to the bear. He lay still as she pulled the blankets up to his shoulder and tucked them in under his chin. She leaned over and kissed him on the right temple. The smell of her perfume hung in the air after she'd left. The headlights of the second car swept across the ceiling as Dad pulled into the driveway. Number two, William mumbled into his pillow. More doors and running water and some whispering in the hall. Then the big house was quiet. He let a little more time go by, just to be on the safe side, and then got very quietly out of bed. Come on, Bear. Let's go upstairs and get that knight out of his box. He pulled his reading flashlight out of the drawer in his bedside table and crept down the hall with Bear tucked securely under his arm. William knew how far to open the attic door so that it wouldn't creak. He and Bear slipped through without a sound. He flipped on the light switch and left his flashlight on the bottom step. The castle loomed above him, a great gray shadow. He was glad he brought Bear. All right, your lordship, I've come to meet you, William announced in a loud voice in order to cheer himself on. There was an odd, expectant sort of feeling to the attic. He propped Bear up against an old trunk and knelt down. In the middle of the courtyard, the small box sat right where William had left it. He picked it up and opened it. In a soft bed of crumpled tissue paper lay the silver knight. He carried a shield decorated with a cross in one corner and a small carved figure of a lion in the other. William noticed the sword was missing from the knight's scabbard, although his dagger was in place on his right hip. His right hand was raised with a clenched fist as if he were challenging some unseen enemy. After studying him for a moment, William picked him up. To his amazement, the figure felt soft and wrinkled and warm. And it moved! William screamed and dropped it. With a tiny clanking noise, the knight fell back down into the courtyard. William grabbed Bear and pounded down the stairs. He stopped outside the attic door. He couldn't really be alive. I must have imagined it, he said as he tightened his hold on Bear. He opened the door again and peered up the stairs. There was no sound. Come on, he said. I'm not going to be scared by a lead knight two inches high. With that, he marched back up the stairs and peered over the wall of the castle. The knight was still lying on the ground where William had dropped him. William gave him a little push with his finger. The man's tiny arm fell across his chest. He's really alive, William thought. Are you all right? He asked. He watched as the small man rolled slowly over onto his side and pushed himself up into a sitting position. He pulled the metal helmet off his head and set it down carefully beside him, smoothing the red plume with his fingers. At last, he looked up a very great distance to William. When he opened his mouth to speak, William leaned down to listen. He asked a question in what must have been his normal voice, but William couldn't understand him. Say it again a little louder, please, William called. The man covered his ears with his hands. Sorry, I didn't mean to shout, William said more quietly. You talk louder and I'll talk softer, okay? The knight tried again. What have you done with Alistair? He called out, his voice a tiny croak in the courtyard. Who's Alistair? William whispered. The knight struggled to get up, but his legs wouldn't work properly. Still sitting, he snatched his dagger from his belt and pointed it at William. William had to work hard to keep from being to keep from laughing at this ridiculous position the knight was in. Are you friend or foe? The knight shouted. I am not frightened by your size, my good sir and I will battle you with every ounce of strength left in me, if that be your wish. William stifled a giggle. He was being threatened by a seated miniature man waving a pin-sized knife. 
It might be easier to fight me standing up, my lord. Although I don't doubt your strength and courage. Let me help you up. I am your friend, and I shall ever remain so, if you will allow it. William was quite proud of his little speech. Those hours of reading about King Arthur with Mrs. Phillips had paid off after all. The knight put away his dagger, and slowly William placed his index finger down close to the man's shield. He leaned on William's extended finger and pulled himself to his feet. The knight didn't let go immediately, so William held himself very still, the way he had once done when Jason's parakeet had landed on his outstretched palm. At last, the small man felt steady enough to support himself, and William drew his hand away. He's as tall as my index finger, William thought to himself as he sat back on his heels. Both were quiet as the knight adjusted the sleeves of his tunic and gave his metal shin guards a quick shine with his handkerchief. His motions were precise and unhurried. Using the wall for support, he moved his legs about slowly, bending and unbending them at the knee. Then he worked out the kinks in his arms. You look like me when I'm warming up for gymnastics, William said. The knight didn't answer. Although William was bursting with questions, he waited for this small person, who was clearly used to making people wait, to finish pulling himself together. I thank you for your patience, kind sir, said the knight. Allow me to present myself. I am Sir Simon of Hargrave, known in my own country as the Silver Knight. I'm glad to meet you, William repl replied, remembering his manners. I'm William Edward Lawrence. I'm sorry I dropped you. I thought you were made of lead, and then when you moved, I got scared. May I ask, is this country peopled entirely by giants? William grinned at the question. He'd certainly never thought of himself as a giant. Yeah, he said. I'm one of the smaller ones. And are they all friendly? Not always, William said thoughtfully. He wasn't sure either of his parents would be happy about this tiny intruder living in their attic, for one thing. But you're safe, he added. The only ones who ever come up here are me and Mrs. Phillips. And who, may I inquire, is Mrs. Phillips? She's the one who gave me the castle. She played with you when she was small, but I don't think you ever came alive for her. At least, I'm sure you were made of lead this afternoon. What happened? You must have broken Alistair's spell, Sir Simon explained. But wait, where is the magic token? I snatched it from Alistair just before he spoke the words. Where has it gone? I must find it. The little man, looking desperate, got stiffly down on his hands and knees and began to search the floor. What does it look like? asked William. Like a medal with the face of a man on one side. William leaned over the courtyard. It probably dropped out of your hand when you fell. You start over there and we'll meet in the middle. They both searched in silence for a while, William running his fingers back and forth across the courtyard as if he were spreading glue on the floor. Suddenly, he hit something that skidded across the space towards the night. They both went for it, but William got there first. And he picked up the tiny, round piece of metal. With a demanding air, the knight stepped back and thrust out his hand. I just want to look at it for a minute, William said, ignoring Sir Simon's impatient gesture. It was about the size of a baby aspirin, and on one side he could just make out the outline of a man's head with two raised lines next to it. Tiny hinges stuck out from either edge at the level of the man's ears. William flipped it over. The other surface was smooth and empty. It's hard for me to see it clearly, William said. I wish I'd brought my magnifying glass. Sir Simon took it off the end of William's outstretched finger and put it carefully away in a pouch that hung from his belt. Why is it so important? William asked. I believe we were talking about Alistair's spell, Sir Simon said. You are the one who broke it, and I'm exceedingly grateful to you. Why was I the one who broke it? William asked. It must have something to do with who you are, Sir Simon said. But why me? I don't know, and I don't intend to find out tonight. If you would be so kind as to direct me to the bedchamber, I will take my leave. William had more questions, but he decided they could wait. Of course, my lord. This way, please. With his forefinger, William slid open the door to the kitchen. On the far side, you'll see the stairs leading up to the bedchamber. I'll leave some food for you in the kitchen tomorrow morning, but I can't stay to talk then. 
I'll come up again for a visit in the afternoon. Till we meet again, said the knight. After a slight bow, he disappeared through the kitchen door. He is the perfect size for this castle, William thought. Too bad you slept through all of that there, William whispered as he found his way down the stairs. It would have been nice if someone else had seen it happen. Then I'd be sure it wasn't just a dream. William fell asleep with his thumb rubbing the small pinprick the dagger had made in his palm. <laughs>